Manifesto by Frank Dickens. With Michael Williams as Bristow. Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs. Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, and featuring Liz Fraser and Joan Sims as Gert and Daisy. Repaying Mr. Piper. Every time I set eyes on the lazy, cretinous, good-for-nothing, pathetic creature that answers to the name of Jones, I find myself curious as to the mentality of the person who, upon meeting Jones at the inevitable first interview, decides here is a fellow with a future in a white-collar environment. <sighs> what manner of man would even consider making an offer of employment to someone like Jones, so out of place in civilised surroundings? And anyway, what kind of supercilious being is it? Sets himself up as both judge and jury to decide whether John or George or Jack is the right man for the job on offer. <sighs> I remember the interview for my first job as if it were yesterday. And that, I suppose, brings me to this job. Marked with an asterisk, that is the nearest after this one on page three, which I explained a few moments ago, to the job for which I am applying. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes. Why are you showing it to me? Because I only work on reception and I don't know what you're talking about. I think you need recruitment. That's it. Recruitment. That's why I came to you. I can see how the mistake occurred. Both words, reception and recruitment, start with the letters R-E-C before they go their respective ways. Reception, recruitment. <laughs> Most confusing. Oh. You ought to mention this to someone in authority. Third floor, room 417. Mr Piper. Ah, hi. Mm. Good morning. Good morning, Miss Piper. <laughs> and may I start by saying, how cunning of you to be sitting with your back to the window, so that whilst you can see me clearly with the light playing on my frank and open features, I can see no expression whatsoever on your face, and therefore will have no idea of how the interview is progressing. You are, to use an old RAF Battle of Britain fighter pilot term, coming in out of the sun. You fought in the Battle of Britain? Uh, no. But for me, it is required reading. And I have a great deal of literature on the subject. I see. And you are applying for a job with F&D Educational Toys? That is the object of my visit. And, may I say, if the reception I have been so far accorded is anything to go by, I will fit in here like a pea in the proverbial pod. You think so? I know so. That is, unless my handwriting lets me down. <laughs> you see... It cannot keep up with the performing flea that is my mind. It lacks the speed, you understand. <laughs> I do understand only too well. <laughs> and the reason why we can't offer you employment is because I don't think you'll fit in with the present staff at F&D Educational Toys. You are turning me down? That's right. May I ask the reason? I've already given it. You won't fit in with our present staff. On a scale of one to ten, how would I not fit in with your requirements? I don't understand the question. I'm not particularly interested. The door is over your left shoulder. You don't want me? No. Is that your final answer? Yes. You won't change your mind? No. Final answer? Be gone, Mr Bristow. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone. As I came out of the building, I realised I had been tried and sentenced by this one man's judgement. The idea that a stranger can alter the course of a life by a sudden decision makes no sense in a civilised society. For had that man been in a different mood, I might have been in the educational toy business from then until this very day. The question I asked myself as I made my way sadly up the street is what went wrong. Was it Piper's fault or my own? 
I was not to know the answer until many years later, when, as I left the Chester Perry building, where I work as a buying clerk, I was accosted by an evil-looking man, unshaven and wild of eye. <coughs> oh, afternoon, sir. Any change to spare? Change? Enough for a cuppa. You see, I come out without any money, left it on the bedside table. Uh... No, I can't get home. I need the fare, like. Oh, thank you, sir. Is that all? Yeah. Not much, is it? Still, I suppose it'll get me started. You, you work for the Chester Perry Company, don't you? Huh? I, I've seen you go in and I've seen you come out, so you can't deny it. And Looking at your cheerful and open face, I can see you've got a good job there. As a matter of fact, it's a lousy job. Haven't we met before? No, sir. Uh, oh. oh, Piper's the name, Sid Piper. If we'd met, I'd have remembered. I've got a memory for faces. Well, I have a feeling for events. And I have a feeling we've met before. Yes, it's coming back to me. You interviewed me once. F&D Educational Toys. Oh. You turned me down. Uh, F&D Toys, eh? Yeah. Uh, could, could be, could be. I turned down so many. Yes, I remember you. Yeah. The Battle of Britain chap. You accused me of coming out the sun. You said I wouldn't fit in with the people who worked there. Well, you wouldn't have done. Would you like to know why? Oh, of course. I'd like to tell you that if you got the money for a drink, the snug bar of the Brolly and Bowler is around the next corner. <laughs> Follow me, my dear sir. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Yes, uh, my story is a sad one. Oh, yeah. Many years ago, the, the time you saw me, I was personnel officer at Evan D. Educational Toys. Oh, yeah. I fell passionately in love with the boss's daughter, a graceful creature fresh from finishing school in Switzerland. I asked her father for her hand, the customer at the time, and he had the effrontery to laugh in my face. So? Told me I wasn't good enough. Laughed in my face, he did. Not good enough. Not good enough. I work my fingers to the bone for him in his lousy, rotten firm, and he tells me I'm not good enough. Hey, keep it down. We can't hear ourselves sing. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now they know, where was I? You weren't good enough. Uh, uh, that's right. Not good enough. <laughs> Angry and frustrated, I, I determined to ruin him. With this object in mind, I decided to engage simple and uneducated people, uh, thinking that by filling the place with simple and uneducated morons, the business would go down the drain. That's when you applied for a job. <sighs> when you told me your mind was like a, a performing flea and mentioned handwriting, I put you down as too intelligent to work there. Oh, yeah. oh, oh thank you. Uh, too intelligent, eh? <laughs> Would you like another drink? Mm, yeah. <coughs> Too kind. Yeah, yeah. And did the business go down the drain? No. Quite the reverse. Mm. The educational toys did their job. The staff all turned out to be above average intelligence. And I got the sack for not being up to standard. Another drink, did you say? Why not? <laughs> <sighs> That night, I hardly slept through thinking of the conversation. It was obvious that by employing idiots like Jones, the personnel manager at Chester Perry's was adopting the very same tactics used by Piper. But why? Was he involved with Sir Reginald's daughter, the fabulous Fiona? <laughs> I determined to find out. <laughs> Jones, what's the name of the personnel officer here? Oh, forget it, Bristow. What do you mean, forget it? Bristow, don't make an even bigger fool of yourself than you already are. What's that supposed to mean? You forget. This place is like a village. Word gets round in seconds. What word? About what? The accounts department was giving a farewell party last night in the Brolly and Bowler, and you were seen having a drink and a serious discussion with a tramp in the snug bar. We don't want that kind applying for a job here. Some of us have stamp. How do you hold a moonbeam in your hand? Yeah, I'm 
Do you have Earl Grey this morning? Earl Grey coming up. Oh, holy mackerel. Oh, come down off your chair. A bit of tea won't hurt you. <coughs> Mrs. Purdy, who is the personnel officer here? Mr. Sheldrake. What's he like? Sheldrake? Ah, oh, weak tea, no sugar. Oh, got him, yes. Middle-aged, very nice, very handsome, likes the ladies. A proper Lothario. Oh. Or should I say, was a proper Lothario. He's getting married soon, someone down there was saying. The kitchen staff concern themselves with what goes on up here, do they? We like to keep our finger on the pulse, so to speak. Our tea bag in the water. <laughs> I just thought of that. Tea bag in the water. Oh, good, isn't it? Mm. No, the reason I say he's getting married soon is because one of the girls saw two spoons in his saucer last week. <laughs> two spoons in his saucer means a marriage is on the cards, does it? Of course it does, <laughs> and the signs are never wrong. You can laugh all you like, but they're never wrong. <laughs> what is going on out here? Uh, Mrs. Buddy? Are you going to be talking to Bristow for much longer? He's wasted enough time today. Oh, I'm just going, Mr. Fudd. Goodbye, Mr. Bristow. Tell me your work, Bristow! So, our Mr. Sheldrake is a bit of a Lothario, is he? <laughs> Most interesting. And they say history has a habit of repeating itself. Oh. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Bristow, uh, my ears have been burning all day. That means there are millions of people all over the world telling themselves that there's always someone worse off than themselves, mm -hmm. and your name springs automatically to their lips. Yeah, it's very funny. Ken, Hewitt, when you applied for a job here, mm -hmm. who interviewed you? Uh, Mr. Sheldrake. Was it a good interview? Uh, not really. I had the feeling I'd got the job anyway. Uh, you got the impression he'd have hired anybody. Uh, well, sort of, yes. Yeah. He's a relaxed sort of guy. Look, uh, Mr. Bristow, do you ever ponder on the meaning of life? Yes, frequently. Mostly when I'm doing the filing or invoicing. Oh. Or, in fact, any of the jobs that flesh is there to... Yes, well, I can see you're in a flippant mood. I'm going downstairs where they talk seriously about things. The plot thickens... It seems to me this Sheldrake character is tarred with the same brush as my down-and-out acquaintance of last evening, and by employing people of Jones and Hewitt's ilk, is endeavouring to ruin the Chester Perry organisation. <laughs> Speaking personally, I have nothing against this, but why should he wish to do so? Unless, as I mentioned earlier, the daughter of the firm's founder was involved. <laughs> Mm. How dare you send in work like this for me to type out? Let me see that. Get holy mackerel. Right in the middle of a business letter. I do apologise most sincerely. I saw some graffiti from the train window this morning and it, it must have stuck in my mind. <laughs> uh, uh, before you go, Miss Sunderland. Yes? How old is Sir Reginald Chester Perry's daughter, the fabulous Fiona? Why? Oh, there's no special reason... There must be a reason. You don't suddenly ask a girl's age for nothing. I'm not asking on my own behalf. I'm asking you because, um... Because Mr Jones mentioned it. <laughs> Mr Jones? Mm. <laughs> no chance. She's the same age as I am. Ah, a mere slip of a child, then. Oh, give over. <laughs> and suddenly, Lady Luck who had been lying low for yonks, smiled on me, and it came from an unexpected quarter. Bristow, mm. take this up to Mr Sheldrake's office. Mr Sheldrake's office? Is there something wrong with your hearing? Mm. I find myself having to continually repeat myself when I am talking to you. Pull yourself together, man. Concentrate. Yes, Mr Fudge, certainly, Mr Fudge. <laughs> Concentrate. Don't well, get on with it, and don't take all day. Mr. Sheldrake's office was on the floor above. It's open. Good afternoon, Mr. Sheldrake. He's not in at the moment. He's gone to have a haircut or something. 
Can I help? Uh, will you give this to him? It's from Mr Fudge mm. of the buying department. Mm. The big, fat, bald-headed chap with a loud voice. That's him. He painted a very good word portrait of the bane of my life. <laughs> it must be hell to work anywhere near him. That voice of his goes right through you. It's worse than that. It travels via accounts, production, development and costing before it goes right through you. <laughs> What's it like working with Mr Sheldrick? Ah, uh, he's a pussycat. Is he? <laughs> Have a chocolate. Yeah. Very kind of you. <clears throat> <laughs> He's always mm. buying me chocolates, mm. and I'm always giving them away. <laughs> Take two. Mm. <laughs> mm. Is that a guitar on his desk? Yes. He plays it when he's in a good mood. Mm. He's in love at the moment, so we've had love songs all morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Is that the time? Mm? I must get on. I have things to do. <laughs> You have a stool to get the work done, then? Good Lord, no. I have a hairdressing appointment at three. <coughs> the next morning, Happening by chance to come across the cleaning ladies, Gert and Daisy, enjoying a well-earned cup of tea, I decided to pursue my investigations. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Good Mr. Morning, Mr. Bristow. Mr. Bristow. I wonder whether you can help me. I'm interested in knowing something of Sir Reginald Chester Perry's daughter, Fiona. And with the pair of you cleaning their stickly home, I wondered whether you could tell me something about her. Oh, certainly not. And I'm surprised that you're asking, Surprised that you're asking. Well, it's just that I wondered whether she was going steady with anyone at the moment. Oh, we wouldn't know. We are not privy to her love life. Our lips are sealed. Mm. She doesn't leave sonnets and love poems all over the bedroom or carve anyone's initials on doors and tables. We don't know anything, and if we did, we couldn't tell anybody. Especially you. Daisy, don't be rude. Mr Bristow's only asking. Let him ask someone else. We've signed that paper. You see the problem, Mr Bristow? We've signed a paper. <laughs> I quite understand. Thank you both. Of all my ancestors, the one who stands out in my mind is Uncle Gaylord Bristow, who plied his trade on the Mississippi steamboats. He used to brag that he would always back a hunch, and until he met his death at the hands of some unsportsmanlike cattle barons who threw him over the side, said that his hunches had never let him down. My admiration for him owes much to the fact that I seem to have inherited his intuition. And e'en as I speak, I'm on my way to the postroom to test my hunch. Hello, Mr Bristow. What can I do for you? Yes, postboy. Does your cousin, the fabulous Fiona, have a boyfriend? She has loads of boyfriends. Anyone in particular? How about Sheldrake of Personnel? Joe Drake? Mm. Don't be daft. He wouldn't get anywhere near Fiona. Ah. Uncle Reg wouldn't allow anyone working here being in the same street as her. Yeah. Sheldrake would lose his job if he even tried. Ah. My hunch paid off. The swinging playboy Sheldrake turns his roving eye in the direction of Fiona Chester Perry, but realises he would lose his job if he followed up, so he decides to bring the firm down. Thanks, Uncle Gaylord. <sighs> I needed to talk to Piper, so after work that night I drifted into the lonely, seedy, tacky back streets by the canal. The only sounds my footsteps, the howling of a stray cat and the splashing of water rats. <laughs> It was getting dark, and the streets were silent, ominous. 
there was danger here. Hello, Mr. Bristow. <laughs> uh, Stokes, the Chester Petty caretaker. Yep. What are you doing in this neck of the woods? I'll come out for a walk. Well, why choose these mean and sordid streets? I live in the building, don't I? You come out for a walk, you're in mean and sordid streets. Um, what you doing here? That's more to the point. I'm looking for a Mr. Piper. You wouldn't know him. Who wouldn't? I know everybody round here. Sid Piper ain't here today. Uh, he works the city in the South Bank on Fridays. Tomorrow's the best day to meet him. <laughs> he goes to the Panda and Bean Shoot, the pub opposite St Mary's Church in Religion Street. Uh, be there about three. <laughs> Be careful, Mr. Bristow. Mm. He's a tricky one, that piper. Bad blood. Yeah. Watch out for that stray cat. I can't see. The next day, I made my way to the Panda and Bean Shoot. Arriving there just before three, it was packed. There was no sign of Piper, and I decided to wait outside. I purchased a drink and made my way to the garden. Across the road, crowds of people were arriving at St Mary's Church for a wedding. Hello, Mr Bristow. Good heavens, Mrs Purdy. I didn't recognise you without your trolley. <laughs> what are you doing here? I'm going to the wedding across the road. Didn't I tell you two spoons in the saucer? Two spoons means a wedding. <laughs> I told you, but you didn't listen. You <laughs> laughed. Well, I'm laughing last, and you last, last, last longer. You can't claim that. If your old wife's tale is right, the spoons found in Mr. Sheldrake's saucer means Mr. Sheldrake himself will be getting married. That's right, he's getting married today. He threw a shindig last night while you were out on the town with Mr. Stokes. I wasn't out with him, I just bumped into him on my way to meet someone. Honestly, this firm... You missed a lovely party anyway. Mr. Sheldrake was in a good mood, telling everyone about his good fortune. That's why I invited everyone to the wedding. Oh, look! There's Mr. Jones and Mr. Hughie. I don't believe this. Hello. The weekend is here and I'm surrounded by the same old week-long faces. What on earth are you doing here, Bristow? Hmm? You weren't invited. Oh, you didn't come to the shindig yeah. last night. I a great party, Mr. Bristow. I didn't know anything about a party. Nobody mentioned a party and I was in the office all day. Oh, uh, it, it was an uh, impromptu, a, a sudden decision on Mr. Sheldrake's part uh, and we couldn't find you. Yeah, that's right, we couldn't find you. Hello, Mr. Bristow. Well, well, Gert of Gert and Daisy. I didn't recognise you without your bucket and broom. <laughs> Where's the other half? I'm here, Mr Bristow. Ah. But what are you doing here? You wasn't out. Ooh, what's that for? Sorry. Oh, ignore her, Mr Bristow. She gets confused at weddings. Uh, Did you get that information you wanted? About the owner? Uh, uh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, are you ladies here for the wedding? We're here to clean up afterwards, really. Don't throw confetti till they're clear of the pool. <laughs> you, Mr. Bristow. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Sullivan. Another man married, another hope dashed. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Oh, no, no, here comes Mr. Sheldrake. Oh, Ooh, don't no. you look so hard. Well, he should do. After all, he's marrying into money and plenty of it. And at last night's party, he told me he's been offered a partnership in his father in law's firm which means he'll never have to work again. So that's why he was hiring any old body. He couldn't care less what was happening to Chester Perry's. He's marrying Fiona. No, Lorraine! Lorraine? Lorraine. 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 Yes, Lorraine. It's her father owns F&D Educational Toys. F&D Educational Toys? Did you say F&D Educational Toys? She did, F&D. Toys. Educational. F and D. That's what I said, didn't I? Oh. Hello, they're going in. Oh, come on, Mr. Bristow. Come into the church and see the happy couple wed. Come on. Protesting feebly, but caught up in circumstances beyond my control, I allowed myself to be led across the road and into the church. As if in a dream... I heard music.
My mind was still whirling at the strange turn of events. I had completely misread the scenario. Spellbound at my own stupidity, I came round to hear the priest intoning the words that everyone waits for. If any man here knows any reason why this couple should not be joined together in holy matrimony, let him speak now. I do. Saint Viper, what the man that wasn't good enough for her. Ask her father, he'll tell you the great tabalard. Take your hands off me. I will make my point. It's the friend of Bristol. Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Bewes as Jones, Dora Bryan as Mrs Purdy, Owen Brenman as Hewitt, Liz Fraser as Gert, Joan Sims as Daisy, John Glover as Fudge, Mr Piper and the Vicar, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy, David Batley as Stokes and Jackie Neglia as Miss Pleasant. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall. Sound recording was by Graham Harper, the director, Neil Cargill.